consumer expectations are changing. Recent research showed that retailers who were both implementing digital tools and rethinking their business around those opportunities offered by digital were selling more cars and reducing more costs than others. To respond to these challenges, we need to attract new and more diverse skill sets into our business. We're looking at more targeted, careful training. Uh, we're looking at targeted recruitment for people outside the industry and of course, more flexible working patterns. To have the skilled workforce to drive business transformation, we need to collaborate to accelerate this progress across the sector and share best practice solutions for attracting and retaining women and other underrepresented groups. The automotive sector has began work on improving its diversity, its equality and its inclusivity, but it needs to work harder, it needs to work faster. Fantastic. Let me get, uh, again, our introductions, not only here in the room, but also, I hope, live from Spain um, to kick us off. Uh, Ian Plummer from Auto Trader. Andy Silverfield from Halfords Auto Centres. Hi, I'm Mark Raven, CEO of Lookers. And Julia, can you hear us? I can. Say hello, Wonderful. Julia Mio from founder of the Automotive 30% Club. Fantastic. Julia, kick us off, if, if you would. I know you're, you're joining us from Spain, but you're very much part of this conversation, and you, you're the ideal person to, to kick us off. A kind of overview of the skills picture. Well, yes, because the Automotive 30% Club has members from across the sector. We have 70 members, including OEMs, retailers, and uh, companies in the supply chain. So, we see very different uh, requirements with regards to skills, but also some very common themes as well. So really, I mean, I've worked in the sector for 30 years now. We've always complained that we have a skills deficit in the sector, but I'd say that the biggest changes that are happening now is, that, is the rate of change and also the complexity, the number that, you know, there is multiple factors affecting us in a short space of time at the moment. And we need the as many as much innovation that's uh, that's happening with regards to the technology side of the sector. We need to be thinking innovatively as well with regards to the skills side of the sector. And I think one of the 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 core, if you like, shared themes that our members have is it's not only that we struggle to find people with the ability to learn the technical and technological skills. We also struggle to find the people with the actual kind of core foundation of employability skills. So diligence, conscientiousness, dependability, the ability to communicate. Um, I saw your one in your previous panel, um, the, the person from Ford. Well, I, I started out in Ford and I can remember seeing all over the uh, the Dagenham factory, a phrase that said, um, do it right first time, every time, on time. And the skill to be able to do that, the diligence and conscientiousness to give the quality and to work to a high standard that the automotive sector has always been proud of to do, is seems to be getting harder to find that in youngsters and in the general population. Hmm. And as our technological um, skills requirements increase, we also need people with the human skills, the relationship skills, to be able to explain this huge innovative uh, transformation that's taking place in the sector for all the reasons that I'm sure your previous panels have talked about electrification, uh, digitalization, and also the impact we were in the post pandemic scenario of the, the mass resignation as well. You know, all of these uh, factors affecting us. But it's so important to be able to look at being able to divide what the skills requirements are with regards to technical and technological. But also bearing in mind, we still need the human skills, you know, the things that can't be automated or passed on to AI. We need to find those uh, those people out there and we need to be looking at the fact that our sector is now in competition with with sectors that maybe youngsters find a little bit more glamorous than automotive. You know, that maybe they're looking at, if they want to work in technology, are they thinking of working in Google or Facebook rather than working in automotive? So we have, as a sector, an image challenge. We have to develop ourselves as an employer of an inclusive employer of choice for as many talent pools as possible. Mark, what would you uh, say to that? Particularly, actually, that that 
last point, the, the, um, the glamorization uh, of the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is right. I mean, we are a member of the 30% uh, um, club. We're, we're proud to do so. And obviously, I agree with everything that uh, Julia has said. Um, but I think there is a, you know, there's a tsunami of, of change. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be more change over the next decade than there's been over the last century, and I honestly believe that. Uh, electrification brings challenges uh, in terms of how you sell, how you service, how you repair cars for a whole host of reasons. And I think the real challenge is, uh, as electrification uh, gathers momentum, and it absolutely is, I would say just in one in three inquiries now that we receive are on electric vehicles. So I think that pace and that momentum is going to, to increase. And that does mean we need new skills. And being glamorous, I think, is part of that. I mean, if you look at a, a typical technician type role, um, you know, it's not going to be what it was. I mean, it's a computer driven thing. It's very Apple-esque. Um, so these are different jobs, and we are actively searching for new people outside the sector to bring in those skills. New people and different people. Yeah, yeah. That's the interesting point, isn't it? I mean, where you are looking, in a sense, has got to change. Well, I think we have a double whammy because, on the one hand, we, we as a business are, uh, you know, servicing and repairing combustion engines, and that's going to be going on for some time. Make no mistake of it, because there's, there's a huge run out, and that all has to be serviced. But on the other hand where you're seeing new technically based product coming in. So if you were to walk around a typical 30 bay workshop now in, in one of our sites, probably two of those would be dedicated to electrification. That's different tooling, different diagnostic equipment, different sets of people with different skills. As we move through the years, we're going to see, we'll be giving more and more space in our workshop to that product. And that is a real challenge to manage both those streams. Yeah. Ian, how do they do it? I mean, when it comes to looking at diversity in the widest sense of, of, of new areas of people, people with different skill sets coming into the industry, how, how good is the industry at the moment at doing it? And what's got to change? Well, I think the industry um, embraced change massively during the COVID era because we had to. Um, and I think retailers did a fantastic job, for example, of selling huge volumes of cars at distance when that was the only option available. And I think they learned that that was actually something to embrace and an opportunity. And it's actually what consumers wanted. They wanted, wanted more flexibility about how and when they buy their, their car. They wanted to do some digital steps, some physical ones, and they wanted to join it together in the order that suited them. Um, they embraced that and uh, got on with it, and I think really uh, saw that it could deliver results for the consumer, which is good for any business, but also for their bottom line. What we see in research when we look at how those digital tools that have been implemented and the kind of journey that Mark described, they've been on, they've made great progress. But when we look at who's done best, it's those who've not just embedded new tools, but changed their structures. So if you just take the example of um, how hard things are to change uh, you know, your transformational journey about how you're organized, that's colossally harder to do than just launching a new digital tool. The digital is quite kind of easy, it's the change that's hard, but it's when you change your structures and really adapt to the, to the new way of doing things and the expectations of consumers that you do generate the kind of opportunity I mentioned on the video of selling more cars more efficiently, generating cost savings and so on. So we are seeing a lot of engagement in that direction within the retailer world, but a lot still to, to come. Uh, Andy, from your perspective and your, your particular area of, of expertise, tell us again about, I mean, start with, with, the, with the difference in who you are wanting to bring in, if indeed there is a big difference, and, and, and then on to how you do it. I think it's about recognising that things have got to change. Um, our vehicle technicians are not getting any younger. <laughs> um, and as they get older, they perhaps don't necessarily want to engage so much in, in retraining into you know, the more... Uh, the new propulsion methods that are out there. So, and of course, we're, we're also running off the back of, you know, we, we ought to have apprentices now that are qualifying that became apprentices two years ago, but of course, during COVID, many apprentices um, fallen out of uh, employment, as did many other people. So we're kind of hit by this perfect storm. So, you know, from our point of view, you've got to look outside of the normal recruitment box. You've got to look out in, into areas of the, of the community that you wouldn't or haven't historically normally gone into um, to look at those new skills because they're out there. You've just got to go and look for them. Um, and you know, if automotive um, is to evolve with its consumer, it must reflect its consumer. And that's very much about you know, ensuring that you reflect the community that you serve. Yeah, uh, Julia, that's the aim, that there is then the business of how to actually do it in, in practical terms, isn't there?
Well, exactly. And it's it isn't actually um, it's not rocket science. It is just a way of approaching the business as as a whole um, in that a people strategy should be driven at board level. It should be driven by the CEO of the organization. It should be monitored with metrics and data. Um, the board should be asking why. Why don't we have people from those types of populations working in our organization when we serve that community? Um, so it's all about being led from, from the top, having a people strategy that's led from the top. It's about identifying and segmenting possible recruitment markets and, and talent pools, just in the same way that we're very good at segmenting our customer markets and getting to understand what they want. We have to make sure that our, as, as Andy just said, we have to make sure that our employees reflect that community so that they have a visceral understanding about what the customer wants. Um, and so we should be approaching it with the diligence and, and strategic viewpoint that that would require. I think the challenges that we've had is that many of the sector are still using 20th century recruitment methods and traditional ways of looking for talent. Uh, and those that are more progressive, you know, which is great because there's the very, more, very much more organizations now changing the way that they uh, look for talent, particularly the way that they are looking to um, use the internal talent pool as well as a, a potential first port of call for upskilling and reskilling, but also then going into much wider different populations, particularly obviously with our club, it's about um, really trying to appeal to more women to join the sector and removing the barriers for, that's, that have traditionally been in place for them to progress. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it is, it's very possible to do, uh, and within the the 30% club membership organizations, we share best practice. So I know that that's a theme of the conference. It's about collaboration, but we, you know, when organizations find the right solutions, we're sharing them with other automotive organizations so that the pace of change accelerates. Uh, Mark, the board level point is an interesting one, isn't it? This isn't something kind of just kind of clamped on to, a, to an organisation, it actually changes the whole organisation. Yeah, the, I mean, the shortage of skills is, is so stark, you know, it does need to be owned by the, uh, the CEO. Uh, and I think there are you know, a number of things that we're, we're trying to do in terms of addressing that. I mean, if, I totally agree that from a, in, in our workshops, apprentices are how we're deciding to t tackle it. Our, our intake this year will be about for 350 odd, I would say, apprentices for which we've had uh, about 2,000 applications. So these are really good jobs. I mean, you get, you get training, you get development. Um, and, and, and of course, because the job is changing as well, uh, we're, we're finding uh, the, the, you know, the next generation coming through, to your point, are far more capable of dealing with the change and, and, and learning and, and developing in terms of the new product. On the sales side, we're definitely going outside of the industry to try and broaden our, our diversity. Uh, we've launched uh, our Jumpstart program. Uh, don't try jumpstarting an electric vehicle. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, but there, we, we've actively gone out and, and we're looking for people outside the industry that bring in uh, new skills. Uh, and we've had you know, uh, trainee vets you know, come join the scheme that have decided, have had a change of heart and come into the automotive industry. So I, you know, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Julia. We, we, we've got a fantastic industry. The reward is good. We've got great product around us, highly technical product, technical people, and we should be doing more and we can do more. Ian, is, is, is part of it the kind of the, the broad media story that is told of any industry? I remember my friend Evan Davis saying that a lot of, you know, most modern factories outside automotive, but doing all sorts of, of things, I, I just don't look and feel how the word factory is in most people's heads and it's, it's that it's kind of getting that across mm. in the media more generally just in a sense of people's psyche really the way they look at it completely i don't think our industry has the the best image externally outside of these walls if we're honest but why not what what, well, I, I what think, is it that can change that well i think it was mentioned earlier somebody was talking about the example of sort of imagining a, a technician in dirty overalls kind of thing and that's unfortunately the image or a used car salesman being a little bit sort of you know untrustworthy that that <laughs> that, that, that image is it. out there let's be honest um you're in safe give company, me retailers in the, in the room mark and others <laughs> yeah. uh but it, but this, these, these are realities that we need to confront and i think there are probably three things i'd focus on one is 
the technology point, I'll come back to, and then inclusivity we've just been talking about, um, but also the openness we need to work in, in a partnership sort of format. And lastly, sustainability, I think, is the, the, the big thing that everybody's expecting of us uh, out there in the audience, where, whether you're talking about your employees or your customers, they're expecting those things for tech. If you take just the auto trader example, 45 years of existence, most of you probably know it as a used car magazine, it was then a digital marketplace. It's, we now think we're a tech company, a pretty big one on the FTSE. So we've evolved and we've attracted different people. And the industry needs to do something similar. We're not all going to be tech companies, but we need more tech within our companies to do the kind of transition that we've been on and we're going to continue on. And if you look at um, the inclusivity point, one example, everyone talks about the rightly, and Julia is a huge campaigner for the, the gender pay gaps that it still exist. We've recently been campaigning with a few other FTSE 100 companies in Parliament to try to bring in place a, uh, an ethnicity pay gap reporting um, obligation. But again, all these things will hopefully attract the, the right sort of people. And sustainability, we've embraced a, a journey called carbon literacy, which um, is Im embedded across many other FTSE 100 now, and we've adapted it with the help of many other players in the automotive space, lookers included, to make it automotive specific. So I'd encourage any of you to look at uh, that program as a way of just engaging your teams, because what it does is enable people to go from the net zero fantastic journeys that, for example, were shown by Toyota early this morning, which quite frankly are quite hard for the individual on the sort of shop floor to, to understand and link to. And you can make it much more tangible what a personal commitment can be that, that makes it believable that you have a role to play. If you do all those things around technology, inclusivity, partnerships work more openly and that sustainability point you're more likely to attract people who see the industry as part of the sustainability and future challenges and ability to succeed in them rather than being part of the sort of old world and part of the problem yeah is that part of it julia actually when it comes to attracting people in who who the industry needs to attract it the, it, the industry needs to sort out in a sense what it is is it now a tech industry that is that specializes in automotive or is it still an automotive industry with a tech side to it? Well, the way that we will tend to go into schools and colleges and universities and talk about the sector is that it's advanced technology. You know, that we are um, hugely innovative, it's fast moving, it's probably the most complicated uh, gadget that somebody could ever own, that, that it's moving and changing all the time, and that it, but it needs people that are uh, want to communicate, collaborate, work in teams. Uh, and so we can actually put a really positive spin on it. It's, it's amazing how much the youngsters are not told this by, by schools. They, they think that we are very much, you know, um, Kevin on the spanners under the arches. That, that, that is what the automotive sector is. And we can do a lot to change that, to really focus on the fact that we're actually as advanced technology, you know, the technology we use is ad as advanced and arguably more so than, than Facebook, you know, the, the other choices that they may want to, to go into. Yeah. And I think um, the, the other point that, that we've talked about in terms of salaries, we need to be way more transparent about career opportunities, the remuneration, the reward that's in the sector, uh, you know, the ladder that could be climbed in terms of promotions and progression. Um, and because we haven't really operated as a sector to tra transmit that message, um, it's lost. You know, we don't have the, we haven't had the opportunity to, to make that message land really. Andy, do you agree with, with that last point? A hundred percent. I mean, um... We've, we've got a, a program that we've been developing um, over the last 12 months to, to really sort of open up the opportunity that presents ourselves because, you know, there's a lot of, you, know, you could almost say doomsaying within, within automotive at the moment in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we make that transition? But for me, I see the, um, the move to 2030 as just great opportunity. Um, one thing I'd like to say about sort of d and is that nobody, no one company is an expert on it. And the only way of making it work is by collaborating with experts. Um, we work with a couple of charities, one based in Woolwich, First Step Trust, and another, the Palmer Foundation, uh, developed by Andy Palmer, who we all know. Um, and, and that's all designed to try and um, get people that are generally unemployable into employment positions because you know, they might be suffering from some sort of uh, disability and so on. And Andy Palmer is very much about getting apprenticeships for uh, youngsters from disadvantaged backgrounds. But even those two 
charities working together, even with a big employer like us, wasn't enough. So we had to find where these people were, and that's where we collaborated with London South East College because they, they've got over 200 young people on current automotive training programmes that, unfortunately, not all of them are going to go into automotive. So bringing all of that together and, and with the final partner with the IMI, because ultimately you've got to have qualifications that fit um, people that don't necessarily fit in the normal sort of box, we're able to then... Uh, bring some of these young people in and through a number of assessments and work trials we, we're, we're really proud, proud and pleased to announce the fact that we've employed six of these young people um, in the next coming months to start their apprenticeship in September and the whole point about it and, I, and I'll just make the point that the, the, the programme's called FAST Future Automotive Skills Training and once we've proven this pilot our intention is to give it to automotive for nothing because we want automotive to be able to go out there and use this programme to build a much more diverse, inclusive and equal community within, within the automotive sector that we all know and love. Ian, you're out nodding. I fully agree with all, all those points. I think it's probably in this whole debate important to bring things back a little bit to the, to the car buyer out there as well. We all work in industry that services, ultimately people who buy and uh, sell, repair vehicles and all the parts that go into them. The car buyer at the moment is, is facing, I think it's been touched on numerous times today and will be, I'm sure, more in, in the hours to come, it's facing a huge period of change. We're making it pretty difficult for them. We know it's costly to change electric vehicles. It's challenging in terms of um, infrastructure, etc. Those points are put into one side. And frankly, it's, it's confusing to, confuse, to consumers at the moment. The jargon is uh, new, uh, complex, and it's very varied in terms of how you explain things. So we need to simplify and standardize what we do. If we want consumers to do something which is inherently a big change, a behavioural change, it's not an easy thing to do, it's not got a compelling reason to do it, and it's either you've got more money and or you're very environmentally aware um, and committed to spending your money on that, that, uh, that, that cause, and you're prepared to spend more money buying a car than you for, for, for making that statement. So you have to work on the basis that the easier you can make something, which is already inherently difficult, buying a car is hard, the more chance you've got of succeeding. To do that, one of the things that we've talked about a few times already is partnership. But we've got no standardisation in how we talk about our electric cars. We have different terminology and sort of kilowatt hours, the charging speeds, etc. And we have a huge issue out there around battery health. We all assume that our batteries are going to fail because these things do. And batteries on electric cars don't. There's one of these many myths that are getting in the way. So consumers don't have the confidence, retailers equally don't have confidence in the cars that they're looking to buy and, uh, and to resell. But that then brings us to the second hand market, doesn't it? Exactly. The whole, the whole business of, of, of having a kind of understood and, and easily accessible and trustworthy second hand EV market. Completely. But to make that, um, uh, to bring that confidence to the fore and allow a retailer in that used car market to have confidence in buying and selling a, a used EV and then to give that confidence to their end consumer, you have to have, for example, standardization of this battery health metric that I was referring to. If everybody does their own single thing, and that'll be like marking your own homework and you put your thing on your brand website and it'll be relatively unseen and relatively unbelieved. It's just an, an example of how the industry needs to come together to make the transition easier. And I think this ethos of partnership is equally something inherently valuable within our, each of our sort of perspective on work. We enjoy generally as individuals working in an open way. So I think looking like this rather than like that will help us all, both on the transition for consumers and as individuals and employers. Yeah. Mark, you're nodding at that. I mean, it is interesting it's because it's a kind of wider cultural thing then, isn't it, that, that, that goes to people's view of an industry that just isn't um, uh, um, affected by whether or not they're carrying spanners or whatever, but actually, you know, the usefulness of the industry, the involvement of the industry in their own daily lives. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with what Ian said about the customer. We do need, we do need to put this, the customer central in these things. And, and it's not just about the environmental crises. When customers uh, touch and feel and experience these vehicles, they absolutely love them. Uh, I mean, the performance of these vehicles, which is why I think it's going to go much, much quicker. I think there is this environmental piece, but I think these are much better vehicles. Uh, you know, loads of autonomous features, uh, much better handling, uh, nicer drive, lovely features. Uh, but, but customers, you're right, don't understand them. And there's a lot of barriers in the way. I mean, people phone, up, you know, phone us up and say, you know, can I charge my car in the rain? 
you know, is it, <laughs> is, is it, is it safe? Uh, but so there's, there's, there's a whole host of things that we've got to get right with customers to yeah. give them that confidence. I think, I think they are disappearing. Range anxiety is, is, is going. I think there is an issue with, with the sort of public infrastructure, get that, but range anxiety is, is, is reducing. And there is more and more of this product going to come into the UK. There is something like 25 new Chinese brands coming to the UK over the next BYD being one, it was great to see Mark up uh, earlier. But, but you know, there are a whole bunch of, of, of new brands with great product and the costs will absolutely yeah. come down as well. So yeah. we should be very excited, honestly, about electric vehicles. Uh, I throw it open to you if anyone has any questions. Yes, we've already got one uh, up there. So I'm going to ask our um, uh, microphone holders. Here we go. Yep. If you could move across to the gentleman who's in the corner there, please. My right hand side. Just if go. I may, well, we're just waiting yep. for the mic there to go. Can yep. I just add quickly to Mark's point? Yeah. We do see all those positive points around the features and so on of cars. One thing we have to be wary of, and it links back to the inclusivity point, is we don't always talk to every part of the car buying audience. An example of that is women buying cars. When they're buying electric cars, you'd, we'd like to have believed that they would be more, feeling more included. Actually, research we've done recently shows that they're feeling less included because we talk about features like the tech. If you look at m much of the EV advertising out there, it highlights that kind of thing. And that's, that's working for one in 10 women. They, they buy cars based on that kind of criteria. Three quarters of them will usually look at features like convenience and particularly safety. We don't talk about those features. We don't talk about cars in non-automotive uh, spaces where women are, are engaging with content, you know, media, journalistic content or whatever. So there's a, there's a way that the industry needs to become more inclusive in order to also achieve these challenges, and we've got still a way to go in that regard. Uh, interesting point. Okay, uh, Jim, who's got the mic? Thank you. Uh, Halil Badevi, I'm head of advanced manufacturing at Santander Corporate and Commercial Bank. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments and ask a question about skills. Skills issue has been around for a number of years, and it doesn't seem to be going away. Um, one of the issues is that, uh, you know, everybody's talking about attracting more and more diverse talent. Engineering is fantastic, I am one, but as we all know, every industry needs lots of other professions to help the industry to grow and prosper. You know, we need lawyers, we need sellers, all the rest of it. One of the things I find when I speak to young people is that they tell me I don't want to go into manufacturing, A, because they don't know enough about it, but also nobody tells them that um, you can be a lawyer, but in manufacturing. You can sell things, but in manufacturing. You can be in IT in manufacturing. Because they, in their heads, if you're a lawyer, you're in a law office. If you're a, 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 a IT person, you work in a tech office, uh, but they don't link what they're doing with industries. What can we do to make this absolutely clear to school children, parents, teachers, sometimes recruiters as well. Yeah. Because that one of the ways I suggest that we can change things, um, and perhaps a couple of other things is, um, we discuss these things in community groups, LinkedIn groups, places like this. Everybody knows these things here. Let's not talk about, the, let's take it out. Talk to others, because we all know this, okay? We don't need to hear it over and over again. All right, well, that's one to put. How do we to, do that? Let, let me put that Thank to you. Julia. How, how, Julia, do we do that? And that really fascinating point about the range of careers that there are in this industry that you might not think were, well, aren't necessarily uh, linked to the car itself. Yeah, well, we, we create films where we feature because it's who we are, we feature women doing all of these different roles. And we, our mantra when we're going to schools and colleges and universities is there's a job for everyone and anyone in the automotive sector because we are so big. You know, we have thousands of different roles across the sector and pretty much any job you could imagine we want to do, there is an equivalent in the automotive sector. So once you've, you've shared that huge strategic overview with them, you can then kind of boil it down into different um, functional areas that they could progress into. But it's certainly a massive eye opener for them and their careers leaders who, to be frank, are given false information at the moment. They're, they're given labour market information that tells them that the vehicle technician role is obsolete and that they are very poorly paid. So if as a sector we can get better at providing true transparent information 
um, to our recruitment markets, and not just schools and colleges, but out there on social media, featuring different faces that are doing these roles so that if they can see it, they can be it, that concept. Um, then I think that would be hugely successful. I know the IMI are beginning to do some kind of initiative in that way. Uh, Ian, what would you add, add to that? Because that, that, it's such an important point, isn't it? That there are so many roles within this sector, always have been actually, but they're not really accentuated. I think two things. I think firstly, go out to people where they're consuming their, their content, wherever that may be. Um, as long as you've got a strong employer brand or a message to, to portray, like Julia's around the 30% club, which I think is fantastic, that, that's fan it's great. To your point, within an echo chamber, we'll all hear the same thing, we'll all believe it, but actually we need to take the message out. So it's engaging in social media in particular or in any form of content that it will actually be consumed by people where they're likely to consume it. The second point I think is just openness and partnership as well. To bridge skills gaps within the industry, we all have certain strengths. If we try to be brilliant at everything, we'll probably all fail, but if we partner with each other and in an open sort of format, I think we're more likely to succeed. Yeah. I'd just say it's about using the resources that you have. You know, we've got some great people that work for us in, in every company that we're in. And it's about getting those people out there into the, the connotations, the communities, the schools, the colleges, the universities, and talking about them, what makes them who they are, as opposed to the role. Because the role, the, the opportunities within automotive are immense. We just need to shout about it more. Very good uh, sentence on which to end this panel and have lunch. Julia, thank you very much. Uh, in Spain and a huge round of applause for her and for our panellists here as well. Thank you.